Hello and welcome to Irish Football Fan TV. Delighted to be joined up in Belfast at the launch of the new headquarters of New Era Sports with Rio Ferdinand. First of all, welcome. Thank you. Cheers. Um, just, I know you're in a rush really quickly, um, but you know you're over here. There's players being represented and so on. But how important is it to, to have the support network over in Ireland now, especially you know with the likes of your Robbie Keynes, Roy Keynes, Shazy, as you mentioned before. Yeah, I think it's important. I think the, the talent pool over here is huge. I think there's, uh, there's um, always over the years been great players that have come out of Ireland. Um, and I think right now, I said that we, we see maybe there's a, a gap in the market for us to maybe go in and help and facilitate these young players to make that transition from here to over to, to, to England. But also there's going to be Irish players over there and different, for different nationalities that will, will come on board. But we've we've kind of not in this market, but a similar market will be Wales, where we've done similar jobs, where we've done similar transactions with players and brought them in and out of different clubs and been that support mechanism. Because a big issue for the players that will come over from Ireland from it to England will be homesickness. A lot of them will be homesick um, and they'll have various other issues off the field. And if they haven't got that team or support around them, um, they're, they're going to come unstuck. So New Era, that's, that's an area where we're really kind of strong in and we really believe in. Yeah, absolutely. And you, I know you touched on Robbie Keane, but like, I think I just want, from your perspective, because you're obviously a Premier League legend, one of the best, in, or probably the best in the world at, at one stage anyway, but how good was Robbie Keane? Yeah, he was, he was a top player. I was lucky to play with him at Leeds. He came, he signed from Inter Milan. All the lads were raring to go for him to come. Um, I roomed with him, actually, for, a, for, a, for the time we were there. Um, so I got to know him really well, and he lived underneath me in, a, in an apartment for a few months too. So. Um, great lad, um, off the pitch, a real um, funny guy as well. And when we see each other now, we even laugh and have a good time. But as a player, really, like, I think he's a bit underrated, to be fair, when people talk about the team, top yeah. strikers in the Premier League. I think he has to be, he's in the upper echelon of, of strikers that came into the Premier League. He's a, his movement was, was first class. He wasn't as quick as some players in terms of, like, blistering pace. But his movement and his speed of thought was sometimes a, a, a couple of spaces ahead of players. So, and he's finishing. He could fit all types of finish. Yeah. And just lastly, on another Keane, I can't come to Ireland without mentioning Roy Keane. But how good was he? And what was he like at Manchester United for yourself? Oh, um, formidable player, unbelievable football player. Um, but more importantly, I think as a as a man in a changing room, as a, as a leader. Um, he demanded and expected high standards of people, and he kept the levels very high when he was there. Um, because if he saw the levels were dropping a little bit, he'd be onto people, young and old. Um, he didn't care who they were, reputations. And um, I was unfortunate, really, that I, I, when I signed, he was probably on the, the downward slope for his yeah. career, um, which was unfortunate for me. I'd love to have played him when he was at the peak of his powers, but even then, uh, his influence was was there for everyone to see. Yeah, and you obviously took that on then when you became captain. Yeah, exactly. All right, Rio, well, I know you're in a rush. Cheers, and I appreciate man. your time Thank so you, much. No Thank problem. you, OK? Nice one, man. Cheers, man. Sorry. Yeah, Rio Lee Muddy is going to be the head of the Northern Ireland Stroke Republic of Ireland operations with New Era. Uh, <laughs> and uh, obviously then we've got Chris Gangas here, head of commercial, and Jake Mallon, head of media. Jimmy, first up, congratulations on everything that New Era has achieved today. Just to give everyone in this room who aren't fully aware of what you guys do, a bit of a snapshot of where it started and where you've come to. Yeah, so the, <laughs> the word New Era, it was, I played for 17 years. Um, I had about 10 clubs, started at Palace, Crystal Palace, and then Millwall, then went to Watford, then to Crewe, then to Royal Antwerp, then come back, Brighton, Colchester, and finished up in, in Cardiff. So, uh, on my when I was retiring, obviously I had an agent like a lot of the, the guys we have in here today. Um, and I had some uh, bad experiences, left to my own devices, no real support care or vehicle or structure around me. Um, so obviously I wanted to, as you see there, Trot wanted to change that. And so it was a new era in my life, so I called it New Era. Uh, started at the beginning for the first two years just working with players coming to the end of their careers, just looking at sort of what they got in the bank, what their plans were for the futures, and how at the age of 35 on retirement, how they purely were going to get to the age of 40, um, trying to continue the same lifestyle. And very quickly we found out that by the age of 37, 
down property without, you know, without any financial support or having a, a secondary career, they would be bankrupt. And obviously, we've seen over the last ten years that pretty much most players that have come out of the 90s have since declared themselves bankrupt. So it was a big problem. Um, so obviously, at that point, I was getting into the England camps and I was getting into the bigger clubs and just talking about more financial planning for the players, um, looking into the roles that financial advisors were playing because it wasn't all pretty. And that's obviously where I got speaking to the likes of, at the time, Anton and Daniel Gavidon and Rio. And after two years, they said, you know, listen, we'd want you to be our agent. And that's the way sort of new era begun ten years ago. And we're now at 100 players. And we're very proud today to be opening our island base. And we just feel that, you know, with the talent pool that's here, um, I know in the past there's been sort of 70, 80 percent ratio that lads that have come across into England and, and Europe have come back after one year due to homesick or lack of support. The fact that Leeds base here, um, you know, we have 15 players already that are actively playing in the in the in the English leagues, but we have now that them players now have a support vehicle on a daily daily basis for, for whether it be Jordan Thompson, Ben Hall. Uh, Harry Robinson and the list goes on, Liam Kinsella, I mean listen there's a few here today, Liam Donnelly, Sean Graham where you know they can they can tap into our expertise on a daily basis so whether they face any fears you know we can we can look after them and I think that's a that's a a, a big goal for us. The football, being a football agent it's fairly changed from the agent you would have had as a player to what you deliver now yourselves? Yeah there's some of them still about don't get me wrong and there's many more because obviously being an intermediary now, anyone in this room can, can, can register for £600 to become an agent. So, you know, it's opened it to the masses and it has, it has created um, a lot of negativity because, you know, not everybody is, is, is able to do the job correctly. That was but, deregulating yeah. when the FA decided to deregulate. So now anyone can obviously then become an agent, whereas before someone had to take an exam. Yeah, pass a license. And I suppose the big thing for you guys and, and New Era is trust, the trust you have with the players in order to lead them through uh, with your experience, getting the right deals, and then obviously post-football whenever whenever the career on the pitch finishes. Yeah, of course, and I think, you know, we, on the, we've had some success in Wales with the likes of Ashley Williams, who's gone and captained the country and played in the Euros, and he come from Stockpool. You know, uh, Neil Taylor, who's in a playoff final for Aston Villa this week, he started at Wrexham. Um, we've got other internationals that started non-league, so you know we've having lads that come from lesser academies or even the League of Wales or the League of Ireland. You know we, we we've already put that practice in place where we can we can show that there is a different pathway for all and they can still reach the top. So I think that's important. But the different elements are that you know even just speaking to Liam earlier, I think 17 players at Walsall, his teammates that he's been with for two three years, have just been released. How are those lads going to get a new club? How are they going to get trials? So, you know, listen, we have, there, there are agents that get bad publicity, but those players need that help now to get them back in the system. I want to bring Lee in now. So, obviously, congratulations in the Belfast office. Just, you know, we do have a wealth of talent uh, in this part of the world. So, where does New Year fit in to, to Northern Ireland and the Republic, and, and what are you hoping to achieve? I think really the key is the experience we have in the building, you know. We've got a lot of people who have played the game, we've got managers, we've got obviously like Rio people who have have been through the system, you know, they've come through the, the youth side and they're um, you know, they've come out the other end, they're working now in football still. So really the people we have who have been through on the journey, um, is what sort of sets us aside, I think, from from sort of being able to help these lads making the jump. You know, leaving Northern Ireland's a it's a huge thing, you know, you're leaving your you're leaving your home and your family, and um, so yeah, they need that support network around them, you know, to make that transition. Really, you've been scouting for quite some time yourself. Yeah. And um, so, in terms of, are you, are you looking at players to sign before they get a club across the water, or do they get a club across the water and then they're coming to you? Well, I mean, it can work two ways, really. I mean, ideally, if we're helping lads out of the Irish league, obviously, you know, we'll, we'll help them make that jump um, to England, um, or lads are in, in England who are. You know, obviously from here, you know, it can work two ways. Are you excited? 
Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, buzzing about it. It's great. Yeah, 100%. Um, Rio, welcome to Belfast. You're no stranger to this part of the world. Um, tell us about your, your journey with New Era because obviously you had such an unbelievably successful career on the pitch and now with all the stuff that you did with the magazine and your vlogs and everything and now you've got a hugely successful career on the television. In your mind, is that where you would have always end up, ended up? Um, I would have tried, but I think you need to have a team capable of helping you get to that target and I think the important part of to go back to what Jamie was saying when um, Jamie decided to open the agency I said to him listen the only way I'm going to come on is you've got to make sure that you obviously help me from here on to the end of my career but help me in that transition period of when I retire I want to have four or five options of businesses to be able to go into mm -hmm. and they were true to their game I had a restaurant I had a magazine a media division, production company, um, punditry, um, and a clothing brand, um, to name a couple of things that I could have gone into, which was would only have been able to do with the guys at New Era who helped me, who were sitting on it along here, and various other guys back in the office. So that was I was almost like the guinea pig because um, I trusted Jamie anyway, as uh, became friends and became close. And the big part of it is is that we can all enjoy the good times. I'm an ambassador for the company now and you see a player doing well and you think, oh brilliant, that's great, they've really scored or they got promotion or they've just got a national call up, etc. But I think more importantly, where is the agency going to be and the individuals within that company going to be when there's a downturn in form, when there's problems at home, when there's an injury, uh, when you maybe have to retire. Um, where are the people then? Because that's when you need the people within the company to really do play a big prominent part in your life. And again, a lot of agents are there with their suit and ties at the beginning, good tans, <laughs> when there's good things happening. But then when the negative stuff happens, they go into the shadows. And I think that's where we become stronger. We come out of the shadows and stand side by side with the players. And in terms of being an ambassador, you're a mentor as well for, for some of the talent that they've signed. So what, what, how do you see your role? Yeah, well, like, or do you have players picking up the phone to you looking for advice? Yeah, like for instance, Lee will say to me, Ria, I've got an issue with this player, can you speak to him please? Or one of the other guys have said it loads of times, can you need to speak to this kid? And all of a sudden that just becomes a, a relationship that I then continue with a player, and as and when they need to speak to me. And it could be a player as an international player, like Michael King for instance, playing for England now, Everton. I knew him as a kid at, at United. If he needs to speak to me, he can. If he doesn't, his brother does. But that's um, not just with you, Rio, as well. It's probably Danny Gavidon, yeah. who's finished playing, obviously played at West Ham. Yeah. And then even our players that are still playing, like Ashley Williams and some of the managers, we've, we've created an environment which is a bit like a family. <coughs> so we've got an issue with a player, or a player's going through a bad time or needs some advice, we can pick up the phone to nearly anyone. It's a bit of an organisation like a family where we can all just communicate and talk about any problems that they've got at that time. So. Obviously, it's, it, every player's different. You were obviously a very driven individual and you wanted a life after football and, and, and with the career you had, you probably could have just wrapped it up at the end of your footballing career and maybe not done anything else. Obviously, depending on what uh, level of football you get to, um, some players aren't obviously in that, that position. But if they're not as driven as you to go on and wanting to be on TV or whatever, what does New Era do for those well, that's part of the conversation, that's part of the, the relationship that gets built over the years and the questions that the guys would always ask are, what do you want to do? What's your interests? And I'm no different to anyone else, just because I played at a certain level, the same questions are going to get asked and then it's down to then us to be able to facilitate what your needs are and what your requirements are. And we, it we becomes all, also conscious of football ways come first. Yeah. So when Rio got to a time and place at 28, 29, it was he felt comfortable in what he was doing on the pitch and what he'd achieved at Man United and was going to continue to achieve, but he knew he could balance that with preparing for life after football. So we'd sat down and spoken about what interest Rio had, um, and that's really how the magazine came about, um, because Rio's interest was in fashion and film and music. Um, so we sat down as a team and thought, how can we develop something for Rio? It was interested in content, fan engagement. Um, and at that time, a lot of the social media platforms had started, so Twitter was becoming quite big. Rio was probably the first one of the first footballers, I think probably the first in the UK to really um, buy into that um, and give himself his own voice rather than it always going for other people. He was able to go onto a social platform and communicate with his fan base. So we come up five really as a way of identifying that football was a global sport. It was the world's biggest sport and a lot of the fans aren't just in the UK, they're in Asia, they're in Africa, as we saw the other week when we'd, we'd been out touring Africa. and. We come up with a platform and a, and a way of Rio being able to communicate with them fans every day and 
five, just to vet it from them. Um, talking of five, um, I'm sure you're well aware of it, but if you're not, we're going to bag up some of the stuff that Rio and the team at New Era uh, created with the five brand. And we'll have a young fella, Sam Madden, who's going <laughs> to give us a bit of freestyle uh, whilst we're taking a look. Why not? You got you can earn this amount of money. You can do this, etc. But I would have been embarrassed to be doing a, a, a clothing company, and I'm not even a first team regular, or we ain't winning every week. So, and I, and I didn't know how to prepare properly. So when I was 28 years old, I was comfortable that I, I knew how to win. We were winning quite a lot, and I knew day to day what I needed to do to be the best that I could be. Up until that point, I wasn't comfortable to do that. I didn't know. And as, as players, you don't get to a point in, in your career until probably t late 20s where you know exactly what you need to do to be fine-tuned for a game at a weekend. So to put energy elsewhere, I found baffling and I wouldn't do it. Because again, I'd be embarrassed if I walked into the changing room and I've been rubbish in a game on a Saturday and I know in the back of my mind the manager's looking at me going and he was doing a photo shoot on Thursday for a clothing brand and he found play for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 <laughs> so that leads on to the fact that yeah. I can sense your, your frustration <laughs> with perhaps current players who are maybe looking too much off the pitch yeah. than on the pitch. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't agree with it. And I, and I was a big advocate of doing stuff off the pitch, but as I said, a lot of these guys now don't realise that I was doing it once I was comfortable, once I was a regular player, first team player, an integral member of the team, winning. Um, and again, more importantly, understood how my body mentally, etc., needed to be to be fine tuned to play. And I think far too many of these kids now, they're thinking about. Listen, we, we've been speaking to kids who are 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 years old. You go into a meeting with these kids, and the mum and dad are talking about brands. Oh, but build a, build a brand for him. He, he needs to be a brand. And you're thinking, he ain't even a first team regular yet. What are you talking about? So people are looking at it in reverse sometimes because they see, and we're in a world where social media gives you the ability to see everything. So you see players, people creating brands, etc. But you don't know really know the back way. You see that what's there in front of you. And a lot of families, a lot of kids probably get that element wrong. And to be honest, you create a brand or we create a brand organically. It happened over a period of time. It wasn't like, oh, Rio's now doing really well, Man United, this just go and make a, a headwear brand or an apparel brand. It, it started with a magazine creating content for fans who weren't able to see Rio every day, wherever they were across the world, to be able to see and, and see what his interests were and create good content. Um, and that happened over a period of time, over years, before it then developed into a, a physical brand that you could go and buy, um, which I think was the main reason we started it really, wasn't it? It was about the fan engagement. <coughs> um, yeah, but that helped yeah. to just... The fashion, the, stuff, the, 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 the clothing and that was like a byproduct of the magazine really. It was a case study, we just thought, can we sell some <coughs> merchandise off the back of a, a digital platform, a magazine? And so we just got a few caps made and they just sold out, bang, bang, bang. And it was like, whoa, right, we could be onto something here. <laughs> and then just developed from there. Happy days. Um, I just want to bring Chick in. Um, obviously, Rio's now doing the BBC and, and BT, and the one thing we've got from what New Era give to their... Uh, their clients, footballers, is, is a career path. And what I get from the conversation today, folks, is a heck of a lot of advice. Um, there's only so many pundits can be on the television or on the radio. There's only so many um, commentators there can be. I mean, what way do you, do you go with your clients to advise them if that's the route to, to go down? And, and then how difficult is it to get them on and get them a platform? I think it all depends on each individual. Someone like Daniel Gabadon, who, who Jamie represented for a long time, he, he had a taste of management. Um, at Cardiff when he went in as a caretaker and he was quick to realise that that wasn't for him so that was a quick cross um, and back to the drawing board with Danny and um, we looked at obviously the, the Euros in 2016 that was coming up as a, as a chance for him to get himself within the media um, but he was realistic at the same time um, that there were only going to be so many opportunities so it, it's trying to get the regularity of work um, but then align himself with everyday stuff to keep his mind set um, healthy, which is which is key because a lot of them will retire and, and wake up at 10 o'clock and think, well, what am I doing today? So um, keeping them busy is key. Um, not everything will be financial. Um, he's, he's, he's an ambassador now down at um, Cancer Research in Cardiff, so he spends a lot of time down there um, visiting different sites. Um, so it, it's not always about being a, a, a pundit or being on the radio, I think it's just keeping the mind busy and for us it's key for our players that when they get to a certain point that, that they have targets ahead of them um, to make sure they don't go into pitfalls of, 
of what often a lot of players do um, and can go into. So, and it's, it's the same with management. We, you know, we look after Simon Grayson, who, who unfortunately got sacked at Sunderland um, in October 2017 or 2018, and you know, it, it can be quite depressing as an agent. You know, sitting there alongside him while he, the chips are down, but it was to make sure he come in the office and sat down with us and, and what was next, um, what was next on the agenda for him while he was out of work. There's no guarantee he's going to go straight back in. So you dip his toes into different things. Um, we went across to to Paris um, and where Rio interviewed Tuchel um, not too long ago, and he came with us to watch training. So there's elements that. You know, it's not just always sitting on a radio or TV for these guys. It's the experiences they can learn as well, which get them out of bed in the morning, which is key. The one word I I probably put into what you guys said or are saying is, is well-being and looking after the well-being of your clients. <coughs> yeah, I think mean, that's key from Jamie when you, when you started, wasn't it? I think the, there's not going to be too many Rio Ferdinands about. You know, he's broke the mould a little bit. He's he's captain his country, Man United, and this, but. It's, as byproducts of some of the things that he's done, relationships with BT, BBC, <coughs> Rio's Foundation, EA Sports, a lot of our players that are now 36, 37 and retired are now working in those areas as well. So it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's going to be a pundit, but we've got a guy who played at a lower level, Gavin Tomlin, as an example, and he's now working you know, for the Rio Ferdinand Foundation, getting work actively because he wanted to go and put something back into the estates and the community, that was where his passion was. It wasn't through um, you know, being on the pundit or he wasn't maybe big enough to go and become a pundit. But in the 90s when I retired, you either opened up your own pub or you become a black taxi driver or you opened a sports shop up. Because of the globalness of, of, of the game now, you know, Paul Parker and Steve McMahon, are, uh, Steve McMahon, great players, they're reporting on their pundits, but in Singapore, Andy Gray, uh, and Richard Keyes are in Doha. You know, the, the game has become so global now that there's more opportunities. Andy Cole, you know, he's an ambassador for Man United and travels globally. Dean Saunders, one of our clients that, you know, for the last three or four years was doing, sort of bumming around as manager at Wrexham and Chesterfield. Every time you turn on Talk Sport now, he's on it. <laughs> you know? So, so there's a niche for everybody, but it's the passion that they hold. And it doesn't matter whether or not you've applied a career at Leighton Orient or you've been at Walsall for 15 years, you still the money that you've earned is still more than a normal man on the street. Uh, it, it, what the problem is, is if you, you've only ever known football and at the age of 35 you get put back into society and you, you want to also be a computer wizard or you want to work in the city and there's been lads that have been doing that since they were 17, they've got 18 years head start on you so they can't re-engage and get themselves back into society so that's where we hold their hand and help them but in a niche where they feel comfortable it's not all the glitz and glamour, some of the lads like I say are working at a BT Sport, you know, doing production behind the camera uh, just to see that they're getting back in, giving them that foothold that, that helps them stabilise to then face uh, a second coming in their life because the worry is from 35 to the age of 40, by the time they get to 37, 90% of the 90s and 2000 generation become bankrupt because they can't find full time employment. I think it's, it's key as well to do it at an earlier age, is when Rio said about 28 there, we, I sat down with Neil Taylor and Chris Gunter the other day and, and getting them on their coaching badges. Um, unless you sometimes push these lads to, to make sure they've got qualifications for when they do finish, um, it's no point doing it at 35 and telling them because they're going to waste two years you know, doing it then. So do it now, get yourself prepared for when you're 34, 35 for those opportunities when you come out of the game, um, well, which is key. Gentlemen, you've got a great business going. Your success to date has been absolutely superb. We're going to open the floor to some questions very, very shortly. Um, well, whilst we've got, we've got Rio here, you've been successful on the pitch and off the pitch. Um, I just want to take you back to, to your career, and we all think about you at Manchester United um, and, uh, and the highlights in terms of leagues and obviously the Champions League. But what, for you, is, is your most favourable moment? I doubt it was probably beating Glen Torn 3 0. <laughs> <laughs> but what was being your, uh, your most favourable moment you look back upon? Um, yeah, I think the Champions League is like the holy grail, really. You sit and you think. Can we can we ever get? I got to the semi final with Leeds, got smashed by Valencia. Um, different stages with Man United over the years, and then 2008, the, the jigsaw just seemed to fall into place. 
um, like our front line was like Rooney, Tevez, Ronaldo, like ridiculous in any era, would be formidable. And then behind that, just a, a foundations of big, strong characters and some good players. But it's that one's the one that immediately comes to mind. But winning your first Premier League as a kid who's played for a team at West Ham, you weren't ever going to win a Premier League, and Leeds got fairly close, but he, the team was broken up, and you just think, am I ever going to get there? I'm early 20s, go to Man United, and luckily the opportunity came to come to Man United, and all I've ever wanted to do was, was win. And like, people talk about our oh, money, etc. That is great, but I always associated money that with success, with success. If I'm successful and I play well and I get to the top, then money will just take care of itself. And that's the way I always looked at it. And so success was always the, my, my driving driving force. And when I got to United and got my hands on the Premier League trophy that first season, it was just like, you, you can't put it into words really what it, what it meant. Um, Sir Alex Ferguson obviously played a big part in, in your career. Um, I suppose um, for, for, for fans of football, whether you're a United fan or not, you look at what Sir Alex Ferguson achieved and whilst he was achieving it, it was brilliant. After he retired, you, you look back upon his achievements and they become even greater for what he did. What was the one thing that you'll take away from him managing you? What's the, the one, that, you know, if you, if you th thought about something that he instilled, a value he instilled in you, what would it be? There's, there's too many to mention, but I, I'll be I'd having a desire. Like he'd been managing by the end, like 26, 27 years. He was still first in, he was still last out training ground because there was a desire, there was a, a belief in what he was doing, there was a work ethic um, that he didn't need to talk about. You just see it. Like every day you come in, his car's there. You think, has he got any before me again? <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, but, but that's something that just rubs off on people. You haven't always got to be told, you haven't always got to be preached to sometimes. Just seeing someone do something day in, day out, relentless, is, is something that people feed off. And I think that's what the, the squad will in my time, definitely like, when he, didn't, when he wasn't at a training session, I say it to Jamie sometimes, he's kind of watching that, but if he's not at a training session, which would have been a handful of times in the whole 13 years I was there, the session drops a little bit in terms of intensity and maybe the quality a little bit. Someone wouldn't see it just standing there, but the players, you just know. When he's there, and half the time he's on his phone making bets. On <laughs> <laughs> he's not even like, taking any care of what's going on, but he's just his presence to be there was enough. And so there's, there's loads of stuff. And he, he, he sometimes he wouldn't even talk about football. Like, I remember we, we were all on the bikes. We had a big game. I forget what game it was. We had a massive game. And, and, um, on the Friday, everyone used to be on bikes in the, in the gym, about 22, 25 bikes, the whole team, big screen, watch all the stats come through from games and training and whatnot, all there, just 20 minutes, turn your legs over before every session. All of a sudden, a, a, a trail of like men just kind of coming into the gym, lining up in front of us. It's like, who are these geezers, man? What's going on? What? Everyone's sitting there going, who are these guys, man? And then all of a sudden the manager comes out and says, listen, these guys have been underground for about a month. Remember the Chilean miners that got yeah. oh, underground? Yes. He brought them over <laughs> after and made them come there because we had a sponsor with a Chilean wine company who had a connection out there. He's a wheeler and dealer, so he knows how to move in them, in them areas. And he got them over and they were standing there in front of us and was like, what the, what's going on? What <laughs> and he was like, if uh, this is their story, T talked about it a little bit and that was it. They went out, done pictures and whatnot. The next day of the game, he said, I've done my team talk yesterday. Just go out there and play. If you can't work hard and give me everything you've got, bearing in mind what you listened to and saw yesterday, you shouldn't be here. And we all went out there and smashed someone about three or four nil. <laughs> but that he, didn't he didn't push our buttons by shouting and bawling sometimes. He'd, he'd, he'd just he'd bring different things to the table that you'd sit there and go, wow. I think also what you said to us, the way he managed you, was it when you were playing Chelsea on that? Saturday and he knocked on your hotel room on yeah. Friday night. Yeah, like, we played like, it, yeah, like, he just knew how to manage people, man. He was just a great, like, he's a delegator, which was great. He'd let other people manage areas. But he, in terms of just knowing characters, and we were playing Liverpool on the, on the Saturday, and if you got a knock on your door in the morning, you knew there was something wrong. And my door knocked. Fuck it, oh, okay. Went to the door, opened the door, and said, what do you want? And he went, this is on. He came in, and I said, ah. Oh, you, you can't not play me today. It's Liverpool. I have to play. Like, I've just come back from injury. He's going, you injury. I want you ready. I want you fit and everything. But 
I said, Gaffer, you can't. I was screaming and shouting at him, and he was going, listen, just listen to me. I need, we got Chelsea, Chelsea on Tuesday in the Champions League. That's where I need you. You love it playing there. You're brilliant there. They, they hate you. you. You thrive under that pressure. You'll get us a result. And by the time he walked out, I was shaking his hand saying, this guy's gone mad. <laughs> That's the way he was. He could just cajole you into just like... And then in the end, I go in the change room that, that morning uh, for the game against Liverpool. And I'm going to everyone, come on, good luck. Except for where's before. I might have walked in there depressed going, this is a joke. I hope you get beat 2-0. <laughs> Well, why should, why should you mention Liverpool? Were you pleased that Liverpool didn't win the Premier League? Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, Will Liverpool be Spurs in the Champions League final? I hope not. Uh, and whenever you look back at that clip on BT Sport with you and Gary Lineker and you're celebrating Messi's free kick, yeah. yeah, we didn't see too many videos of you and Gary celebrating when Liverpool were going on to score four. The cameras, the cameras weren't on. <laughs> Uh, do you have any questions from the floor?